So now I'd like to bring up Ami Bhatt. Ami is an assistant professor of medicine here at Stanford. She is also our uh, director of global oncology, and she started a nonprofit called Global Oncology, or GO, that connects cancer researchers uh, in a global network. And she's going to run our report back from the breakouts. So Ami, come on up and bring your peeps. All right, so thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks to the whole team for setting this up. Thank you to all of you who flew from near and far or drove from near and far to be here. I'd like to now ask the session leaders for the report back to come up to the stage. You can line up on the left and the right sides here. You're gonna hear from each one of our session leaders for about 90 seconds. They're gonna give you, I know, and I'm really serious about time. Uh, they're going to tell you the top three things uh, that are kind of take home points from the topics that they discussed today. Um, so with that, I'm gonna call them up one by one. Uh, when your name is called, please come up to one of the mics. You'll have 90 seconds. That's all right. Oh, so, so first, uh, from the climate group, Shana Janssen. Thank you. Um, we had an enormous number of uh, take homes and uh, highlights from our session, but three that really resonated with me are one, that we are now at a tipping point. Um, climate change is no longer a side issue, it's a human security issue. And as women, we need to come together and as connectors, as collaborators, and as protectors of our children and our families, we need to come together and address this issue together. The second is that women are powerful advocates of change. Um, at the community level, women are leaders, and we need to just capitalize on that and empower women to further change at the local, regional, country, and international level. And last but not least, um, the power of education. Um, this came up in several of the groups that we need to continue to educate within our families, within our schools, starting in elementary school all the way up through graduate school. Education can build accountability um, and it can create a sense of, I need to change, I need to do something to affect our planet. So thank you. Thank you, Shana. Next, we'll hear about barriers from Ingrid Katz. Welcome back. One more time. Um, so uh, to take away three points from this is a bit of an art form, but I will say that um, when you think, somebody made this great point, it's a bit like Maslow's Pyramid. If you want to move to the room that uh, you discuss leadership and how this all happens, you have to shore up this work-life balance situation. And I'm sure almost all of us have either sat on or attended panels where there has been a focus on work life and we're still often scratching our heads trying to figure out how to do it all. I will say that many of us took kind of more of a meta road, um, thinking about things like how do you get happiness um, and being reflective of your own process. And for some of us that means having a flexible um, work uh, requirements and others, it might be facing challenges. Um, certainly sponsorship is critical. And I would say uh, others really focus on kind of the nitty gritty details. But I'll, I'll close by saying um, that before we move forward, and certainly thinking about your next session here, you're going to want to think, we're all collectively, I'm sorry, going to want to think about how we achieve this, uh, what we call now integration as opposed to balance. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Next, we'll hear about politics from Nicole Bates. Thank you. Hi, everyone. First, I need to give a big thanks to our panelists. We had Donna Shalala, uh, Debbie Burks, Natasha Belmoria, and Jen Cates, um, fantastic experts in this space over the past 20, if not 30 years. This is such a timely topic for us. The world is changing quickly, rapidly, in ways that we never thought before. So what we did is we took a deep dive into four themes. The first was the role of science, data, facts, and evidence. And we really took a look at the role of the internet and other social media that provides a secondary platform for second opinions 
Americans and also for naysayers. We looked at globalization and nationalism, and we realized that they actually aren't always counter to each other, although we, we speak about it in that way, and there was a much deeper conversation there. We talked about the multi-sectoral role and the, the gains that we've had in global health because of that approach. And finally, how we actually look at the agenda for health that goes beyond infectious diseases and that we don't kind of pendulum swing or flip back and forth from one to the other, but that we can actually hold all of it. So the three takeaways. First is the what. First of all, let's be honest about the systems that we've created and then how we can build off of them for the systems that we actually need for populations moving forward. Let's also be honest about the business case. Global health is much more than a moral argument. We need to be able to make financial, other economic, and other arguments that actually resonates with the audiences who make the decisions. Number two is how we're going to do that, coalitions. Those who are advocating for global health are the military faith-based organizations, academia, not just us as experts. Um, we also have uh, industry and bipartisan congressional or parliamentary actors. And finally is our mindset. Um, first of all, be persistent. Let's be persistent, let's be opportunistic, and let's also be honest. I know that we have a nostalgia about the global uh, golden age of global health over the past 20 years, but it wasn't without its warts and wounds and, and struggles. And so that means that where we are today, we're going to have some warts and wounds and struggles, but we're also going to continue to make progress. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear about the gender lens from Rosemary Morgan. So we talked about the different ways in which we can incorporate a gender lens into our global health research and programs. And so three key takeaways from our session. One is that we need better research and data if we want to enact change. And in order to do that, we have to incorporate a gender lens into our research to really understand the causes of and develop solutions to gender inequities within global health. We also need local ownership of research, along with capacity building to conduct gender analysis because of it is such, gender is such a context-specific thing. And lastly, we as individuals cannot be effective leaders without first understanding gender power relations within our own countries and contexts and to address gender inequities and challenges to women's leadership. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we'll hear about messaging from Gabrielle Fitzgerald. Hi, everyone. Thank you. So we had a great conversation and never enough time, of course. But here are a couple of takeaways that we had. So first, the power of personal voice, what we can all do in the room to advance issues that we care about ourselves. Uh, Sharmila, who's one of the heroines of global health, whose story was featured by the GE Foundation, she talked about making sure you quiet the inner voice inside that's telling you you can't do something. And she said, by sharing what you want to share, you can impact someone else's life. And so don't be afraid of what you might be afraid of, but think about the power you can have on someone else by speaking out. A second takeaway is around the feminine style of storytelling and how important that is in engaging people. We heard from Zoe, who uh, leads Strong Heart Films, and whose new film, Unbending the Arc, is coming out about the formative days of Partners in Health. Uh, the film told a tremendous story about Malkades, a TB patient who is now using his voice to speak out for TB policy change and is now impacting WHO declarations on TB. A third takeaway was it's not only the message, it's the messenger. As Nicole just said, in today's political environment, we need people that really speak to the leaders today. In the US, that's uh, leaders from industry and the private sector. And so how do we tailor the message to the decision makers and what they care about today? They may not care about the moral argument, but they may care about the economic argument, the security argument. Finally, uh, Heidi Larson, who had to dash to the airport and who will be hosting the session next year at London School, her takeaway was that there is so much interest in communication that we need to have a workshop session on it next year. So that's an action item that she'll be taking forward. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we'll hear about leadership from Jess Mack. 
leadership storytelling to dovetail with Gab. I think this, this fits perfectly. Um, so we had a really engaging discussion about the power of voice and how to develop our stories and use them in a leadership context. Um, so our key takeaways are, one, we all have a voice. We all have multiple stories to share, whether you feel like you've led an exceptional life or have lots of letters after your last name or not, you have so many stories that are worth sharing. They're yours to own, they're yours to share on your terms. Um, two, that it's your moral imperative to do so as a leader. And it's actually a, a, a mechanism of power, how you inspire and mobilize others. Um, and it's, it's really something that it's a skill and it's a practice you have to work at um, as you become and emerge as a leader. Third, is that it's really freaking hard. Uh, it's challenging to share stories for so many reasons. It feels vulnerable. Um, we mess up. Maybe we get long-winded. We see our audience's eyes glaze over. Anybody? Good thing I only have uh, 30 seconds left. Um, and that's OK. It's OK to know that it's hard, and we can commit to keep doing it um, and challenging ourselves to continue mining our stories, refining them, sharing them for feedback, um, and really understanding how they move and inspire others as we move in the world and lead. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from the Poverty Group with Zoria Talib. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll just hold it. <laughs> All right. Um, we had a fantastic session with three amazing women, Sonia Shen, Eva Harris, and Tara Lloyd. And we asked them to bring the women into the room who are working in the community. So we, they told stories through pictures. And we heard of a woman from Nicaragua. We heard of a woman from the Navajo Nation. And we heard of a woman from Lesotho. And they were empowering stories to listen to, and what was clear was the, the value of lifting and creating upward mobility for women at the grassroots. They know their communities best. They have bonds and relationships in their communities. And also what was clear was lifting the women and, and creating that upward mobility for women at the grassroots not only creates leadership for them, but has a ripple effect on their families when they're leaders and future generations. So powerful, Im powerful intervention in, in terms of creating leadership. And now the question was how to do that. Distilling that is challenging, but we came up with, I think, four things that we can do to spread, scale, and nurture women at the grassroots. One is partner with them, but let them drive. They know their communities best. Listen to them. Don't come with problems. Come, don't come with solutions, but come with problems and listen to their solutions. Third was amplify their work. Find ways to lift and amplify their work. And fourth was be creative in creating spaces that allow them to play the multiple roles in their lives. Let them be the mothers and the daughters while allowing them to be leaders as well. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear about human-centered design from Danusha Sumowski. Or not, it looks like we have a last minute change up. She railroaded us in, she said it had to be participants. So <laughs> my colleague and I, come on up. Uh, are going to share this. Uh, my name's Julia Marsh, by the way, from the Peace Corps. Um, so yes, I had the privilege of attending the Human Centered Design Workshop with uh, Pam Scott from The Curious Company, and it, and it was not only fun and interactive, but really addressed a, a critical misstep often in development, which is um, kind of a no-brainer for, I think, a lot of us, but it often happens, is that um, we create a solution, design a solution that has um, no input from the end user whatsoever. So um, Human Centered Design is the exact opposite of that. It's creating, designing a solution um, with the end user involved in the process, and that creates optimal output, as we've learned. So within that process, there are a couple takeaways. Um, it's, a, it's a three or four step process, but um, we did three out of the four for time's sake. Um, I had some really awesome takeaways. Um, in the understanding layer, which is your research layer, is there are um, levels to that, too. And we often forget about even the influencers of the end user. That's a key sphere that is often missed. In, in and when we're doing our research is we're sometimes only focused on the very, very end versus what are the systems and structures that are affecting that end user as well. And then in the next step, um, which is the brainstorming, and it's really fun, is to let your mind just go wild and build off each other's ideas. And there is no idea that is wrong or bad. It's a yes and versus a no but. So some wacky, wild ideas are welcome. And then finally, in the create and iterate stage, it's really important to not fall in love. Like I don't know about you, but I fall in love really easily 
And um, the idea is that if you have this idea that is beautiful and you love it, if you hold on to it and dream it and think about it too long, you'll fall in love with it, but it needs to be tested and it might fail and it might die. So if you fall in love too quickly and early and then your idea dies, you're gonna be really sad. So that was <laughs> really fun and I loved that because it really speaks to my personality and you just have to like build quickly so it can die quickly or fail quickly so you can move on to the next person or idea. Anyway, so, <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rowan. She's going to go into a little bit more of like the actual output, like what we built, which was, again, it was really fun. You guys missed out. You should all do it. So, Rowan. All right. Uh, so I'm Rowan. I was also in the workshop. I'll tell you guys just a few takeaway messages. First of all, you do not need to be an expert to do human-centered design. Like today, we were doing um, a workshop about mothers, pregnant mothers and all. I'm a dentist, don't know anything about pregnancies, and I was able to uh, participate fully in the workshop. Second thing is, do not overthink solutions. Um, so everything that I had in my mind today, so that today I learned that quantity results in quality rather than quality is more important. So we also learned that build quickly so you can fail quickly, as Julia said. So never give up is bad advice. Whoever told you that before, if something is not working from the beginning, ditch it from the get-go. So this is, <laughs> this is uh, a small example of what we did today. Um, this is, let me show you guys. This is a baby. A baby kit. Yeah, this is a baby. It's like a Swiss knife for babies. Um, so this is a cable that charges the phone. You can also use it to measure um, the height of your baby. Or your pregnant belly. Or your pregnant belly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's also like a, a thermometer that comes out of the Swiss Army knife that you can measure the baby's temperature. There's on the Swiss Army knife, there's also a, a, heart, mon a heart monitor for the baby. Mm -hmm. And you can also measure the contractions of your own belly. This is also contraceptions that come out of uh, the <laughs> contraceptive pills. We also had like condoms hanging out here, but they fell somewhere. <laughs> um, so I'm going to encourage you all to go and find the baby measuring <laughs> yeah. multi-device soon. This is, this is just to measure the baby's weight. Right. And okay. after we're done, we can pack all this up over here. And this is a Stanford bag. It goes back to me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And next, we will hear about tech from Ann Kurth. And so good afternoon, everybody. We had a very lively session, terrific panel of seven um, wonderful uh, experts, Krista Donaldson, uh, Nimi Ramanujan, Amy Bateson, Ellen Jo Barron, Sally Stanfield, Stansfield, Brooke Partridge, and Jocelyn Brown. And we also had a full house uh, in the room. And as someone posited that this may have been the most women in a Silicon Valley room ever <laughs> talking about tech. <laughs> So um, I'll just go very briefly through. Uh, we have notes that we can share, obviously. But um, uh, I think some of the takeaways, uh, two on the tech thinking side of it, and then one on the personal trajectory side of things. One is think of innovation broadly. We had an example of uh, speculums, which no one likes the speculum. Um, how do you rethink that? How do you make a pocket colposcopy, for example? Um, innovation thinking broadly. And there, it's not just about the widget, right? It has to be about the problem, um, uh, not, not a product-driven approach, but a solution-driven approach. Um, and you need to think of that solution then in terms of the full e ecosystem. That includes the financing piece. It also includes the after development. The, it includes the user end um, uh, engagement in the designs we just heard, uh, and also then the distribution network afterwards. And there are a variety of models for doing that. And it can't just be market-driven, and it can't just be donor-driven, and it can't just be government uh, funding-driven. Um, so we need ways to sort of bring together uh, the communities, the NGOs who often know about the problem, the tech sector that always has the greatest widget but doesn't understand the problem um, uh, necessarily, and then, of course, the financing. Um, and then finally, on the trajectory, it was interesting to hear the bios of each of these amazing women who are leading these companies uh, for tech solutions. Um, and so some of the common themes were follow your passion, figure out the skill sets you need, and then adaptability is the key trait. All right, great. So we heard about integration, we heard about telling your story, uh, we heard about communicating, we heard about breaking barriers. I'm going to ask all of you to help me by doing just four things. Number one, at the reception today, please find one person who you don't know and ask them how you can help them. Um, the power of this group is in this group. And one of the most beautiful things about these breakout sessions is you actually had a chance to get to know one another. So please, Ask someone how you can help them. Number two, and the people in the room who know me will laugh, collect data. I love data. I absolutely am obsessed with data. Uh, collect data. Information is the coin of the realm. It is the key to power. Number three, 
sponsorship. Ask for a seat at the table. And many of you are in positions of privilege here. If you have a seat at the table, ask to bring a plus one. Lastly, do something you love. Do something that is hard. And please, please challenge yourself. I'll ask you only for one more thing, and that is to ask me how I can help you. <laughs>